Well, welcome to Impact Church. Look at somebody and tell them you look better when you're in church. Just tell them you look better when you're in church. You look like less of a sinner. At least a little bit. I want to read from a scripture that you've likely heard and um, we've actually sang about it every song today on this scripture and it is Romans 8 28 if you're ready tell me I'm ready I'm ready PT I'm ready PT and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose I thought we'd read it out loud together ready here we go and we know that we're going to read this out loud together. Ready? Here we go. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. My sermon today is titled, God Will Work It Out. I want you to look at somebody right now and tell them, it might be hard now, but God is working it out. God is working it out. God is working it out. Somebody just needs to see you say that to them. God is working it out. God is at work. Did you know that? I don't know. Did you know that? God is at work. He's working it out. He's working it out. He's at work. You might not be able to see it, but he is at work. I I was thinking, man, one of the crazy life lessons that God keeps showing me, which means I must not have learned my lesson yet because I got I to gotta keep going through the lesson again and again and again, is that things in my life that I thought were devised by the devil to take me down were actually designed by God to raise me up. Have you ever felt that way? A few of you, we clap at Impact Church. We love Jesus. We're a little weird. We're a little, we're a little weird. We're a little loud. I, um, I was thinking, you know, there's so many situations in my life that I thought, I thought were like to destroy me to only find out it was God's process of anointing me. That it is true that David would have never become king without facing that giant. The giant wasn't there to take him down. It was there to lift him up, to promote him. It was an anointing ceremony. And I just think that the giant in your life that you're facing today isn't there to kill you. It's there to promote you. It's there to anoint you. Like Je Joseph, Joseph would have never been, he, he would have never been raised up in the palace had he not been first thrown into the pit. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't thrown into the fire to be burned alive. They were thrown into the fire to prove God's presence is with you in the fire and to put God's power on full display for everybody to see. Because you remember the story, it was the fire that got everybody's attention. And then once the fire got everybody's attention, God showed his presence. And then once everything was all said and done, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire unburned. And then the king promoted them. God will work it out. I know that God will work it out. He will work it out. He will work it out. God, I pray today that you be with us as we look to your word today, God. We pray that you just speak to us, God, that you would change us, that you would challenge us, God, that you would encourage us, but God, also that you would, you would correct us, convict us, Lord Jesus. God, we want to be more like you. We want to be walking in your will. God, we know that you are working it out, and we are grateful. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen, amen. As always, let's give our worship team a round of applause. God will work it out. God is working it out. But here's one thing I want to make sure that we all understand is that God is going to work it out in a different way than you think God is going to work it out. 
If you need a miracle today, does anybody need a miracle? Like, I need a miracle. I need God to do the impossible in my life. When God does the miracle, when God gives you your miracle, when he performs your miracle, I can guarantee you that it is not going to happen like you thought it was going to happen. You're, you're not going to be able to understand how God does what God does because God is God and you are not. God's ways are not your ways. God's ways are his ways, right? And this is hard to, 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 to think about, but we got to trust God in his ways. We got to trust God that he's going to do it, but he's going to do it his way. And this is hard because our human minds don't understand his way because his way doesn't make sense. And by the way, thank God his way doesn't make sense. Because if God's way made sense to you, how small would God be? God's ways don't make sense because God doesn't do logical. God does spiritual. God doesn't do logical. God does spiritual. In fact, 1 Corinthians, it says this, that God chose the fullest things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. God chose the foolish things of this world. Look at somebody and tell them that's exactly why God chose you. Come on, tell somebody. Literally why God chose you. He chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, the weak things, to shame the strong. His ways don't make sense. They don't make sense. God's ways aren't logical. They're spiritual. God chose Moses to be the leader and lead the Israelites out of bondage and Egyptian slavery. Moses couldn't speak well. Remember, he couldn't say, God, I don't even speak well. There's no way. And God said, I'll give you somebody to help you. God's ways are not our ways. God chose to give Abraham and Mary their baby at 100 years old and 90 years old. Like, where is the son you promised us? Yeah, just, it's coming. Just keep waiting. Just keep waiting. It's coming. Where is this child that you promised? Just keep waiting. It's coming. Because God doesn't do things the way we would do things. God chose actual fishermen to become fishers of men. And you and I would not be here today if God did not choose fishermen, uneducated, teenage boy, fishermen to become fishers of men to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ because his ways are not our ways. God chose a teenage peasant girl, Mary, a virgin, to birth our Savior And our king, the king of the world, came through a peasant girl. Because God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are sovereign. You can't explain sovereign. You can't understand sovereign. God's ways are not your ways. God's ways are that we forgive those who hurt us. Is that your way? Because that's not my way. If somebody hurts me, my instinct is not, oh, it's okay, brother. I love you. Forgive you. If somebody hits you, the Bible says turn the other cheek. His ways are not my ways. I'm a pastor, but if you hit me, even if I lose the fight, I'm fighting. I'm going to have to have the Holy Ghost come on me to walk in his ways, right? God's ways are not our ways. God says, pray for your enemies. He says, love your enemy. He says, bless those who persecute you. God's ways are different. This is why it says in Isaiah, it says literally this in Isaiah, that 
my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth. Yeah, yeah. My ways are higher than your ways. I think differently. I have a different perspective than you do. But he's working it out. But because he works it out in his way, sometimes we can think that God's not working it out. And so I really want to give you three takeaways today, three things that I want you to write down because we have to walk this out that God is going to work it out, but I want you to understand three things. Number one is that you have to trust God in his ways. Two amens, that's good, I'll take it, whatever. <laughs> It's been a weird, quiet morning today. This service is failing miserably. I was just thinking like, we always say trust God, but what does it mean? It means trust God in the way he wants to do it. Trust God in what he wants to do. It doesn't, we don't understand God, we trust God. We can't make sense of God but we trust God. I trust you, God. I trust you. I don't know why it has to be this way, but I have to trust in your way. This is where the verse really comes to life in Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six, to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding, Amen. right? In all of your ways, acknowledge him, acknowledge him, acknowledge him, and he will Make your path straight. He will work it out. He is working it out. I don't understand, but guess what? It's not my job to understand. It's not my role to understand. It's not my responsibility to understand. It's my responsibility to trust God. And to trust God in his ways. How many of you are parents? You're a parent? Raise your hand. If you're a parent and your child's a little bit small, you say, don't do that. Is it because you hate them? <laughs> no. It's because you love them. That's not a good idea. If, listen, you should not hang out with that person. And your child thinks you're just evil. <laughs> Especially when they turn 13 or 14 because they know everything. By the time a child gets to 13, they literally mo know more than both parents and all the grandparents combined. They are highly intelligent, right? And you're like, listen, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't want you to do it. And it's not because you don't like them. It's not because you're a killjoy. You love them. You're trying to protect them. They don't understand. But we do. Because we've lived a little bit longer. We've already done that. God sees further. He's bigger. He's better. He's got infinite knowledge. I mean, God is good. And he is working it out. But we have to trust God. I, I was thinking about this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. If we fully understood everything about God and his ways, would we even need to trust God? Because trusting God means, God, I'm okay with what you're okay with. If God's good with it, I'm good with it. I'm okay with, God, what you're okay with. I don't understand. I don't know why you're suffering with that sickness. I don't know why you suffered that loss. I don't know why you haven't been able to conceive a child yet. But God knows. And if God knows, I trust that God knows. And that's my responsibility. I trust 
God, you are at work and you're working it together for the good of those that love, that love you. God sees the bigger picture. You know, sometimes because we won't do what God initially wants us to do, he gets us to do something else that'll baby step us into like what he actually wants us to do. Have you ever, have you ever figured, figured this out? Figure this out. When you're walking with God, he like baits you into what he wants you to do because he knows you won't just do what he wants you to do. And he's done this to me many times in my, many, many, many times in my life where he gets me to go there for now because he wants me to end up over there. But he knows I'm not going to start by just going over there. Let me give you an example. Many years ago, I had a denomination, a church denomination. The, 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 the top guys in the denomination, they, they want to have lunch with me. They sat me down and they go, hey, we think you would be great to start it. You should start a church. And I said, I'm not called to be a, a pastor, a senior pastor. Isn't that funny? <laughs> no, we think you would be great because you've worked for a church and you've been a pastor of a church, but not, not the senior pastor, but you've been a part of a church that grew from nobody, zero people, to 6,000 people every Sunday, and we just think, like, you've seen every phase of church growth. We think you'd be great at being a, a senior pastor. I'm like, well, that's the difference between you and I, because I don't feel like I'm called to do that. And I legitimately felt that way. You know why? Because I kind of looked across the complexion of the world and all these great pastors, and I couldn't see myself inside any of them. Do I look like Joel Osteen to you? I'm not that nice. I'm not that kind. I can't preach like T.D. Jakes. I was like, that is not me. I have an edge that only Jesus can deal with. And they said, well, you know what? Just entertain us. If you were to pastor a church, where would it be? I said, Scottsdale. I said, that's interesting. Why would you say that? Because at the time, I worked in a city called Surprise. You know where that is? It's Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, and then Surprise. <laughs> but I was also serving as a pro sports chaplain to the Phoenix Suns and Major League Baseball, and I could never get the two ministries to marry together because all my athletes lived over here. And then, well, you know, everybody that lives in LA lives over there. You know what this pastor, this, this guy said to me, he said, well, it's funny you should say that because if you wanted to, to, to pastor a church in Scottsdale, we actually have a building that we would give you. That's not what happened. This was the bait. This was the bait. I didn't take the position. I didn't do what they wanted me to do. But God was using that to get me to this. Because without that, I would have never said yes to this. Because some God, God, know, God knows he wants to get you to the letter Z, but he's going to have to Go through A, B, C, D. He knows. I was 17 years old when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I had, listen to this. I thought, when I was 17, I got, I got a DUI and I got arrested and I got taken to jail for DUI. Listen, I thought, Getting arrested at 17 years old for DUI and taking to jail was my punishment and my consequence, but it actually was about my purpose and my calling. I thought, I thought it was about me 
But it was actually about you. Because if I hadn't have gotten arrested and gotten taken to jail that night, I would not have given my life to Jesus Christ that same night. So, the way I look at this is, I got a DUI for you. You're welcome. Because God knew how to get me where he wanted me to be. He knew that you would be sitting in this church someday 30 years ago. Because God is working it out. Because he works all things and orchestrates all things together for the good of those who love him. Because God knew how to get me where I needed to be. God knew what you would need. Listen, he knew what you would need through me 30 years ago. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. He knew, he knew that me being arrested and taken to jail was the route to win many of you to Jesus Christ. That's cool. That's cool. Because he's working it out. Had I not gotten a DUI that night, I would have not found Jesus. I would have not eventually married my wife, Natalie. I would not be your pastor, and this would not be Impact Church. This is how God works things out. And we know, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. The second thing I want you to write down today is this. I thank God in all circumstances. I mean, it was lame, but I appreciate those of you that did give Jesus some claps. You know, it's like a golf clap. It was like a respectful golf clappity clap. Little patty cake for Jesus because the other baby's sleeping. So I just, you know, just don't want to get too crazy. I got I to gotta save my crazy for the football game. I'm going to take my shirt off and paint my belly for a football player. But for Jesus, I thank God in all circumstances because in all circumstances, God is working it out. No matter what your, your circumstance right now looks like, no matter what your situation, I almost said circumvention. <laughs> Whatever your circumvention is, <laughs> God is God is in the middle of your circumvention. He is working it out. You watch that's going to be in the dictionary in about five years. I just made just remember I made it up right here. I thank God because th th this is what it says in the Bible. In, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, be thankful in all circumstances. Look what it says. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. It's God's will. But he is working. He is working. You may not see it, but he's working. Do you remember when God told Abraham, he, Abraham finally had his son, finally, after 100 years, he has a son, right? And he's got this son. The son's a young boy now. God says, I want you to take your son, and I want you to go sacrifice him to me. And Abraham, in full obedience, which, dude, I'm not either doing that either. He's like, hey, buddy boy, you know how you doing? Good morning. We're going to go make a sacrifice to the Lord. Let's grab everything we need, the wood. You know, the this and the that. It's like, okay, daddy. They start walking up the mountain. And Isaac's like, yo, dad, so we got everything but the sacrifice. So where's the sacrifice? <laughs> Don't ask questions, boy. <laughs> they get to the top. He ties his son down. And right before he sacrifices his son, God says, Abraham, don't lay a, don't lay a single finger on that boy. 
Now I know. Now you know what? Now I know that I'm first, that you love me more than anything, even in your precious baby boy. God was never going to allow Abraham to kill his own son. There was a ram in the thicket that he had already been working it out. He had already been working behind the scenes. Listen, for some of you today, you maybe feel like God isn't working it out, but I'm going to tell you that there is a ram that is going to be in the thicket that God is going to provide for you in the nick of time, and God is always on time. Look at somebody and tell them God is always on time. God is always on time. God is working it out. So no matter what the situation is, I can thank God. I thank God for this little dead end in my life because without this dead end, I would have never have found that new beginning. I think, you know what? You should be thankful you got dumped. You should be thankful you got dumped. God is protecting you. He is saving you. From some serious drama. God's got better for you. God's got, you were trying to settle for God's best, second best. (laughs) You're like, praise Jesus, I got dumped. Yes. (laughs) I thank God I got fired. I've been fired before. Did you know that? I have been. I didn't even do anything. That's how bad that was. I worked for this little small church in Glendale, Arizona. West Hollywood. And I was leading worship. I was Daniel and Amelia. There will be joy in the morning. I was just like worshiping. I was crushing it, Monty. Freaking slang, murdering it, Casey. You know what I'm saying? Last about 11 months, a preacher called me into his office. This is what he said. I've been praying and fasting for three days. God spoke to me. By the way, I've never done this in 25 years. But I got to let you go. You know when you're like, yeah, what's really going on? But this was such a man of God. I, had, I knew he wasn't playing around with me. He said, this is what he said. I don't feel like it'd be fair for us to keep you here. Now, hold on. Now, hold on. If this wasn't such a man of God and a man of integrity, I would call BS myself. But I'm telling you that I would not be here if he didn't obey God and fire me. So I thank God I got fired. What I did, did I do something wrong? Nope, did everything right. That's a great reason to fire somebody. Well, it's not a firing, it's a, you want to resign? We'll let you resign. (laughs) I thank God in in all circumstances. I thank God, I thank God that November 14th of 2022, I had a brain aneurysm hemorrhagic stroke. I thank God for that. I'm so glad none of y'all clapped for that. You're like, yeah, me too. I do thank God for that because my life will never be the same because of that. And because my life will never be the same, many other lives will never be the same because of that. And I thank God in that circumstance. I've learned to thank God. I've learned to thank God or I'm learning to thank God. I'm learning I think I'm learning to thank God 
in the bad times in life. Because when I look back historically, it's those bad times in life that were actually really good for me. But I didn't know it yet. And that my most, most difficult times in life were because God was working it together for good. And I look back at this verse, Romans 8, 28, and it, it, I love the first three words. It says, and we know. We know. I know. I know that God is working it out. I know he's working it out. I know it. Our song, Yahweh, we have, we have our impact worship song, Yahweh, there's a phrase, I know it like I know it, that my miracle is complete. I know it. You know why I know it? Because I know God. When you know, some of you don't know it like you know it because you don't know God the way I know God. You know, like if I was like, Monty, bro, KC, this is Monty, my organ player, and KC, my MD, music director. They're fire. They're fire. But if I was like, Monty, I got to talk to you, man. What's up, PT? Man, KC, I was just out back, and I saw Kelvin ripping somebody out back. Churchgoer was walking by. Calvin was pissed. I don't know what was going on. I heard Casey just yelling and cursing and, and just going off. On, and Monty would say, PT, I wasn't out there. But I'm telling you that never happened. Because I know Casey. I, I know him. He wouldn't do that. Who told you that, PT? Because whoever told you that gave you bad information. Because I know, I know Kelvin, like the sweetest man on the planet next to Pastor Travis, he is very sweet man. He's a very kind, sweet-spirited man. <laughs> you know, and you know people, think of some of you know, like, I just know them. They would never do that. I just know them. They would do that. I just know who they, I know who they are because I know them. Because they have a track record. The track record could be good, it could be bad, but whatever their track record is, I know them. I know their character. I know their nature. Listen, God has a proven track record. He has never failed you yet. God is always faithful. So I know that God is at work. I know that God knows what's best. I know that God's going to do it because God has always done it. God has never let me down. He has never lost a battle. He has been tried and true. He's dependable. He's faithful. And I want you to know that I know it on your behalf in case you don't know it, that God is going to work it out. God is working it out. He's working it out. You know how good God is? This is how good God is. God works for your good even when you're not good. <laughs> That's cool. Because, like, if I get treated poorly... Over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I'm done. At some point. <laughs> yeah? You too? Right? God is never done with you. Never done with you. God is going to work it out for your good, even when you are bad. <laughs> He's good to you, even when you're bad to him. You remember the story of Jonah? Say yes, Jonah. Jonah's a great story. Jonah chapter one, verses one through three, it says that God tells Jonah, he says, Jonah, go to the city of Nineveh, the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it. 
because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Uh, look at verse three again, verse three, just the first part of that, verse three. But Jonah ran away from, from the, the Lord. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. Have you ever ran from God? <laughs> he ran away from the Lord. Maybe you're running today. Maybe today you're running from God. You're running from God. You know, you know, you cannot outrun God. <laughs> I, I've been Jonah so many times in my life that I can't even tell you. And I got to tell you, it never goes the way I think it will go. When I go my own way, it never goes the way that I hoped that it would go. Jonah ran away from the Lord. Jonah ran his own way. Not only did Jonah run from the Lord, he ran the opposite way. Not only did he run the opposite way, he paid money to get on a boat and go the opposite. He paid money to run from God. Because when you run from God, you're going to pay a price as well. He paid money and he gets on this boat. God tells him, I needed to go preach to Nineveh. Their wickedness has come up before me. They were, they were wicked. In fact, Nineveh was so wicked that it was the most wicked city on earth. Everybody was terrified of Nineveh. Everybody. The Ninevites were evil. They were barbaric. They, they would butcher their enemies. They would behead them. They would impale their enemies. They would chop off their hands, their feet, their heads, their tongues, gorge out their eyes. They would skin them alive. They, they would use their blood as graffiti on the walls. And then they'd brag about all these atrocities. I mean... Jonah kind of had a good reason. Like, I'm not going there. Because, listen, we do the same thing. Yes, Lord, but not that. Yes, Lord, but I could never commit to going to church 52, son, 52 times of my life in a calendar year. Yes, Lord, but I could never tithe 10% of my income. But you know my heart, God. Yes, Lord, but I, I, I'm not going to read the word every day. Yes, God, except that one thing, I'm not going to forgive because that one really hurt me. It says, but Jonah, Jonah, I want you to do this, but Jonah ran from the Lord. And maybe his excuse is fear. I mean, I would not want to do that. If God called you right now, I want you to go to the Middle East because that's still happening right now. All those atrocities, they're happening right now. And if God said, I want you to go, would you be like, yeah, okay, God. Sure. But, but Jonah ran. He ran. And this is what happens in verse four. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. H have you ever figured out in your own life that when you run from God, you're gonna run your life right into the middle of a storm? Jonah disobeys God. He runs from God. This is crazy. God's still working it out. He's still, he's still in the middle of all of this. He's still working it out. So Jonah disobeys God. He runs from God. He gets on a boat. 
and a storm comes. It says a great wind, a violent, such a violent storm that the ship threatened to break up. We're talking about a storm that is so violent that everybody on this boat is going to die. And then I started thinking, how many times when you ran from God, did it create a storm in somebody else's life? It's easier to think of it the other way, isn't it? How many times somebody else created a storm in my life? That one's easy. But how many times have you created a storm in somebody else's life? I'm guilty of both. I'm guilty of both. Jonah ran from God and now everybody's life is in danger. Verse 11, the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you, Jonah, to make the sea calm down? And Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know that this is my, my fault that this great storm has come upon you. It's my fault. It's my fault. Because at first the storm was like going crazy and they're like, dude, what's going on? And they're like throwing cargo overboard and they're like, we're going to die. And then they went downstairs in the boat and Jonah's sleeping. And they're like, bro, wake up. We're going to die. There's this big storm. Like, what the heck's going on? And Jonah, he's like, it's my fault. I'm a Hebrew. I worship God. I'm not doing what he asked me to do. Bro, it's your fault. It's my fault. Are you sure? Oh, I'm sure. Throw me over. Bro, we can't do that. We keep throwing over more cargo. Storm gets worse. So now they're like, you're right. We're going to throw you over. <laughs> We're getting rid of you, bro. And they throw him overboard. It's my fault. Look at somebody and tell them it's my fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. I'm sorry. It says in Proverbs 14, 12. It says there's a way that seems right to a man but its end is the way to death. Woo. How many have lived that verse? Come on, you've lived that verse up. No, that should be every hand. If you didn't raise your hand, you just lied in church on a Sunday morning at the 1030 a.m. service, which is, means you broke one of the 10 commandments inside of the church of God. I'm asking, how many have ever lived out a way that seemed right to you but it led to a dead end. It led to death. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is, I mean, just because I don't think you guys are getting it. This is how this scenario could play out, hypothetically. You're a woman, and you want a man. And let's be honest, you've been wanting a man for a while. And you now starting to fall off this little edge of desperate. You're like, I really want a man. <laughs> and then you meet a guy. And you're like, oh, pitter patter, heart splatter, dude. This is the man. He's not a Christian. Let's just say maybe he's atheist. But you're so desperate. And he's so nice. And he's nice. Wait, what? You ain't said nothing in four months and now you're preaching out loud. I'm just kidding. So, so here's what happens is you get into this relationship and it seems right to a woman. It seems right, but it's not right. You know it ain't right. You know why it's not right? Because the Bible calls it being unequally yoked. And if I'm a man of God, 
I need to yoke myself with the woman of God. And when you're equally yoked, because just play it out, because unfortunately it might be some of you in here today, and, and, and my heart goes out to you. You, you, you're unequally yoked in your marriage and, and maybe your husband didn't even go to church. Yeah, I don't want to go to church. You could preach the sermon better than I can. You start having babies. Hey, we should, we, you know what? We should take our child to church. Mm-mm. I don't believe in that nonsense. Make believe fairy tale. Hey, we, we should have a devotional at night with our child, with our children. Nah, you guys do it. Cool, whatever. You know what? I like to start tithing. I like to start showing God with my money that I put him for. God, you're number one. God, you're number one. We're not giving to that place. There's a way that seems right. But in the end, this was Jonah. I ran. I went my own way and I figured out it's not a good way. So throw me overboard. Verse 15, then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. Dude, if you want some storms to calm down in your life, stop running from God. Only if you want some storms to calm down in your life. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord provided a fish, a huge fish, to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. You know how I I view this verse? I view this verse and everything it says through the fourth word in this verse. And the word is provided. Because he's working it out anyway. The Lord provided, he provided, he provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. That fish wasn't Jonah's punishment. It was God's provision. Without that fish, Jonah would have drowned to death. Listen, sometimes God's provision looks like you've been tossed into the depths of the sea, doesn't it? Sometimes God's provision looks like a dark deep, lonely place. Sometimes God's provision looks like something in life that is going to swallow you up. That fish was God's provision to protect Jonah because without the fish, he's going to drown to death. And not only to protect Jonah, but to get Jonah to go where God wanted him to go. So imagine God's working it out even when we're not working it out. God is working on your behalf even when you're not working on your behalf. God is good even when you're not good. God is working it out. Imagine all of this that God is orchestrating together for the good, together, but it's an orchestration because He's got to orchestrate the ship and the storm and the sea and the fish all together. This is like cool stuff. But see, the problem that we have is we can only see the one place that we are in at that moment. I'm in the ship I don't know that I'm about to get thrown out the ship. I got thrown out the ship. I don't know that there's a fish coming for me. I'm in the fish. I'm pretty sure I'm going to die inside of a fish. I don't know that the fish is going to spit me out on the shores of Nineveh. I don't know that yet. Because you're not supposed to know it yet. You're supposed to trust. You don't have to understand. You have to trust God's way. See, God doesn't just see one moment. He sees all the moments at the same time. We only see what's right in front of us. We see the storm and we don't know what's next, but God sees the ship, the storm, the sea, the fish all at the same time because he's working 
it together for good. Then it says in Jonah chapter two, we now made it to chapter two. Verse one, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. Yo, I have prayed in some really cool places, but I have never prayed from inside the belly of a fish. That's cool. He prays from inside the fish and he says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and he answered me. Number three. I turn to God and I repent. He's working it out. I trust him. I thank him and I turn toward him. I repent. Acts chapter three, verse 19 says, repent then. Look at somebody that you love a lot and tell them you need to repent. Tell them right now, you need to repent. Repent. Everybody needs to repent. Some of you had too much fun. You're like, yeah, this is what I've been trying to say for like three weeks now. This is what I've been trying to You need, no, you all, everybody, we all, we need to repent. Let's talk about repentance. Acts 3, 19. Repent then and, and what? Are y'all with me? Yes. Repent then and turn so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repent. You know what repentance is? Repentance is, it's two things. It's confessing. It's admitting, confessing that I'm a sinner, that I've done wrong, that I do wrong, that I did wrong. And turning away from sin and toward God. This is not, this is, this is not repentance. I'm sorry, Tyler. Dude, I'm so, I'm sorry, Tyler. Dude, I'm, dude, I didn't, I didn't mean to. I, Tyler, geez, dude. That's a lot of the way we live our lives. I'm sorry, do it again. I'm sorry, do it again. I'm sorry, do it again. I was wrong, do it again. That wasn't right of me, do it again. That's part of repentance. The easy, the easy part is saying I'm sorry. The hard part is turning away and never going back to that and doing it again. Never again. And I'm grateful that I can always turn back to God, that I can always pray to God, even in my darkest places, even during my greatest fears, even during my greatest sins, even during my greatest failures. I thank God that I'm never too far away from God that he won't take me back. I'm thankful that you can run from God, but God's going to just run after you. I'm thankful that I'm never too broken for God to put me back together. I'm thankful that I'm never too low for God to meet me at rock bottom. God met me and I met God at rock bottom. Did you know that God loves to schedule appointments? with you at rock bottom, inside the belly of the fish. At your deepest, darkest moments, God is there. I don't think you heard me. At your deepest, darkest moments, that's how good God is, is that God is there. He will never not be there. God is there. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. Now, now we've made it to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 2, remember he said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. Jonah chapter 3. The Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. Honestly, this could be an entirely different message. These, these three verses could be easily a, a, another message. But I love that he says, I love that he says these two words a second time. 
the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Because I'm so grateful that God gives me second chances. Anybody else grateful? That God gives us second chances. That he gives us another chance. That he gives us another chance. God comes in a second time. In verse 3, this time, Jonah obeyed. This time. You think? This time, because I ain't going through that again. You feel that? This time, I'm going to walk in what God wants me to do because I am never going through that again. This time, I'm going to do things differently. This time, I'm going to do things God's way. This time, a second chance. This time. Would you bow your heads with me? Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Listen, maybe you're here today. and Maybe you can feel the conviction when I say you're running from God. Today, you are running from God. You know you are. And you're making excuses. I've been there. I make every excuse. Yeah, but God, you know my, I'm running from you. I'm running from your call. I'm running from your truth. I'm running from your will. I'm running from the truths of your word. I'm running. And God wants you to know today that he's not going to stop running after you. And if you're tired of running today, if you're tired of running, and you say, man, PT, that's me. That is for me. I've been running. I'm ready to just stop running. I'm ready to surrender my life to God Almighty. If that's you today with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, that's you today. Would you lift up your hand right now? Come on, lift up your hand. I'm done. I got to stop running. I got to stop running. There's easily 100 hands, up, maybe 200. That's me. Lift up your hand. Today, I'm ready to stop running. I need to stop running. You're preaching to me. God's speaking to me. I want to stop running. I'm so proud of you for lifting your hand. I'm so proud of you for lifting your hand. Today, I'm ready to surrender everything. I I want us to pray together as a church family, everybody. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, today I surrender. No more running, only running to you. Thank you for the cross and dying for me and forgiving me of my sins and for giving me another chance. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me your will. Strengthen me in your spirit. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, look at somebody and tell them God's going to work it out. God's going to work it out. Will you stand to your feet with us? Come on, God's going to work it out.